us off with a screenshot, if that's all right. I'm gonna ask everybody to smile and say, hmm, yes, cheese. That sounds good. Ready, everyone? <laughs> Thank you, smile. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started. I will share my screen. Very good. Well, welcome back to the Equity and Mobil Mobility Advisory Committee for the I-5 and I-205 pool projects. We deeply appreciate your time and commitment to this project. I wanna introduce you to Susan Heyman. Big wave, Susan. She's co-pilot today and I really appreciate her help with all of this. So thanks for joining us, Susan. So today's purpose is to frame the work of the committee by using the Oregon uh, Transportation Commission's charge for the EMAC committee. We will look at the charter and we will look at the equity framework. So um, I'll also be introducing later on all of the project um, staff so you'll, when, I, when we, you see them over the next uh, few months, you'll be able to say, oh yeah, I've, I've seen that person, I've heard their name before. But they're, they're also going to be a great resource as we go through this process. So welcome again. Uh, Brett is your technical um, person. Yes, Brett Watson waving there, yay. Um, please jot down his phone number. Um, just in case you have problems trying to get on later on um, or in and out or back and forth. So just make sure that you have his email address and that you can text him here. We'll be, again, recording this, um, the entire meeting. So it is a uh, public record and it'll be made available um, probably by the end of this week um, on the, the website. We are also live streaming this meeting on YouTube, and you can find that link at oregontolling.org. So again, Zoom etiquette, raise your hand if you don't mind with the virtual hand button so Susan or I can call on you. Um, when we call on you, please unmute yourself. And again, this wonderful handy dandy um, options at the top of your screen, click on that, and then at the drop down menu, click on side by side, so then you can uh, move it back and forth and be able to see the PowerPoint as well as people at the same time. So that is very helpful. I will be also um, going in and out of the PowerPoint deck so we can see each other during some of the presentations. So the chat is disabled for attendees and participants. Um, we'll do our best to make sure everybody's uh, hands uh, get um, acknowledged when it's your turn to speak. Um, and um, I may call on you to ask you to take up space if I haven't heard from you. So I wanna be able to make sure that that's okay with everyone. So if you can give me the thumbs up, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we'll have a public comment at the end of this uh, meeting for 10 minutes. Uh, people will be able to have two minutes to speak. Susan will be able to run the timer for us. That'll be wonderful. If you wanna provide detailed written comments um, prior to 11 o'clock yesterday, um, all of those comments were shared with the committee at 2.30 this afternoon. So so um, you have those in your email. Um, if people want to make extensive comments, they can go to Oregon Tolling at odot.state.or.us or make a phone call and uh, call 503-827-3536 and say EMAC public comment. So that is the way to be engaged and we really encourage people to be engaged in this process. Today we'll start off with our land acknowledgement, do a centering exercise, our reflection question, 
And then we're going to have a discussion about how we do this work, how our interests can come together, the agreements that we have, and then we'll move into um, the draft charter of this committee, have a conversation about that. Um, Lucinda will be able to uh, give us um, a project overview and we will be hearing from Cooper around the acknowledgement by ODOT. Then we'll move into stakeholder uh, engagement with HANA. And then we'll have Chris who will be presenting on the equity framework and facilitating a, con a, con a conversation around that. Then we'll have comments and then next steps. So, Moving into our meeting, the purpose of my land acknowledgement is to center the traditional native inhabitants of the land upon which we live. I want to respectfully acknowledge the Chinook, the Clackamas, the Clackskanai, the Kalapuya, the Malala, the Multnoma, the Tillamook, and the Siletz people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I pay my personal respects to their elders, both past and present. I invite you to close your eyes or to look down gently and just settle in to your chair. Feel the chair under your legs. I invite you to breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold it for a second. And then breathe out your mouth. Feel your hands on your lap. Breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold it for a second. And then breathe out your mouth. Feel your feet on the ground. Breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold it for a second. And then breathe out your mouth. Slowly open your eyes. Breathe normally and welcome to the room. In your journal or your notebook, I invite you to spend two minutes reflecting on what we, on our listening session last, last month. It was really deep. It was really important. And I want you to think about two things, two different perspectives that you learned about that you didn't hold before. So I invite you to spend two minutes to uh, reflect and jot some notes down. Thank you. Ten seconds. Okay. 
Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right, I would love to introduce our team here. The project team for this work is led by Lucinda Broussard. She is the Oregon Tool Program Director. You'll be hearing from her later. Hannah Williams is the ODOT Community Engagement Coordinator. You'll be hearing from her also. Um, uh, Francisco Ibarra is with PSU. He is your intern. You as a committee get to have an intern to be able to do research. Um, when you're asking for data, when you're asking for um, historical documents, whatever it is that you need, we'll be able to work with Fran Francisco to be able to get the committee that information. So that is very exciting. Of course, you have me, yay! Um, Heather Wills is with WSP. This is the owner's rep side. She's the project manager. Josh Channel, Anne Presitin, Penny Maybe, Karina Garcia, and Brett Watson are an incredible group of people that I get to work with to be able to support you. So I just want you to be able to know their names and their roles, and you will be seeing them throughout this process. So the process. The most important thing I think is to start off with the purpose of the committee. So I'll be going over that. Um, then focusing on our collective interests, the agreements, and the draft equity mobility advisory committee charter. I'll have a, a conversation around that. So the most important thing is to provide input and support to ODOT during the technical and environmental review process to ensure the milestone decisions of the project are met. So we're going to learn about milestones, which are through the NEPA process. That will be coming up next month. Um, but that all of these recommendations that we do make, that you do make, are grounded in the equity framework which you're going to learn about this afternoon. You'll be providing input on the mobility and equity strategies for the tool projects going through the environmental review process. You'll be supporting um, the development of an equitable engagement plan, making sure that we're reaching all of the right communities as well as um, supporting the implementation of that equitable engagement plan, because we're going to be asking you to go back out to your communities, back out to your organizations, getting that information and bringing it back. So really you guys are the conduits, the, the liaisons, the facilitators, the people that are going back and forth, disseminating information, collecting it, and then bringing it back here to the committee. You'll review, improve, uh, improve, and recognize and apply the equity framework. So the framework that I've given you is a draft. And then I, I invite you to make it your own. Add, subtract, change. And then ultimately is to provide written recommendations to the Oregon Transportation Commission. So how do we do that? Um, I, I love brainstorming. I love the um, ability for those really off the wall um, answers, suggestions, perspectives to be brought up because there is no wrong answer doing a, during a brainstorming session. So I, I'll be encouraging us to step into that, into that blue sky space. Then journaling will be important. Um, I'll, I'll always be asking you to, to think back to that last meeting and keep notes and then to be able to keep um, questions going. If something doesn't get answered, then I want you to be able to refer back to that question that hadn't gotten answered yet. Um, I'll have, we'll have facilitated conversations. I may open them up. I may keep them really tight. It just depends on the topic and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I want to examine the realities second and put the blue sky first. 
So yes, we have parameters. Yes, we have a sandbox we have to play in, but let's think big and then we can figure out how maybe that thinking big can actually be enacted. And then find other ways forward. Like I invite us to think differently about the things that we've done um, and what we can bring to bear on this project. So um, are there any other strategies or any other things that um, you would like to uh, add to this? So Susan, I don't have a big view of people. So if people raise their hands, could you pretty please let me know? Will do. Do not see any hands yet. Okay. All right. Well, um, please, along the way, I invite us to think differently, interact differently, have interesting, um, vibrant conversations. And um, so please step in when, when it moves you. I invite everybody to participate in the way that they want to. But again, we need bumpers. We need to be able to listen and believe and reflect on what other people are saying. That is a very important um, set of skills to bring to this work. Accept non-closure for the moment because this is a long process. We're not gonna um, have you know, definitive answers today. I invite us to step into the long run Speak your truth with compassion. Um, sometimes a person's individual truth can be very difficult to speak. So I, I, I invite you to give yourself compassion when you're, when you're speaking hard things. Again, listen to understand, don't listen to respond. Value and celebrate each other's experiences. I truly believe that having an open heart and an open not mind gives us the ability to explore other possibilities, things that haven't been brought up or um, different ways of thinking. So I really want us to step into those spaces. I want you to, to make space for everybody to speak and then take space. If I haven't heard from you, I may, I may call on you or if you are, you know, just going and going and going, I might say, okay, <laughs> we, we get the idea, and is it okay if we move on? So I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance. I want us to bring our best thinking into the room. I want us to attack the problem and not the person, and that I do honor disagreement, frustration, and differences of opinions, so, and I will do my best to acknowledge, explore, and address. I might not they have the answer, but I think the answer is always in the room. So may I have a thumbs up on our agreements? Any non-thumbs up? Susan, can you see for me? I, I feel that everybody is on board. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone. All right. So here we are, the meat, the meat, meat, meat. So equity and mobility advisory committee charter and vision. So I'm going to have these two slides, the mission and vision and the guiding principles. And then I'm going to ask us, then I'll, I'll stop sharing and we'll be able to have um, a conversation. So collaborate with, project, with the project team, the people that I just introduced, to bring voices and perspectives not traditionally included in the planning process. So uh, many of your organizations represent these people. Document how those voices improve and inform project outcomes. So we're going to want to identify as well as capture those voices. We're going to want to partner with the project team to implement the equity framework at each stage of the project development. Again, you guys will be able to weigh in on this equity framework. And then deliver on ODOT's commitment to meaningfully involve the public in important decisions. So again, that goes back to 
being the liaison, being the conduit between your organization and this group. So if you have any questions and comments, we'll, we'll attack that after this next slide. So the guiding principles. We wanna apply new independent and creative thinking to provide equitable outcomes and equitable engagement processes. We wanna apply a holistic approach with the transportation system that looks at other social determinants of health. We wanna to, want to acknowledge and center the current inequities, be goal-oriented, use data and evaluation tools to measure progress, practice inclusivity and equity, consider best practices for community engagement to create inclusive, comfortable, and welcoming environments at all, for all, and then be transparent in our process and consider transparency in the community engagement. So that is our charter, that is our mission and vision and our, oops, and our values, and I can't seem to get out of unsharing. There I am, okay. My mouse is creating havoc. So, <laughs> welcome to our conversation about the charter. I would love to um, open up the floor here what people have to say. because I know this is scintillating. Yes, Abe, thank you. Everybody, hope everybody's doing well. Um, great guiding principles and vision. One initial thought that comes to me is maybe adding in something under the guided principles related to just our current climate in COVID and uh, economic recession and social justice movements and acknowledging that this is a time where a lot of the groups that we're um, looking to support throughout this process are, are have a heavy burden on their shoulders already and we want to be thoughtful about that because we're going out and engaging with them. Um, so maybe incorporating some trauma-informed approach principles into the into the charter to kind of ground that as an expectation uh, moving forward. Thank you. I love that idea. Um, how would you suggest that they show up? Can you give me a couple of examples? Maybe, if I think, if I think a little bit more. <laughs> I know, um, right? I'm putting well, you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I can, I can work on drafting up like a draft bullet, but one thing is just with a trauma-informed approach is acknowledging that anything can be a trauma um, for anybody at any point in time, regardless of what, whatever it is. Um, and so kind of approaching things that, um, conversations and, and being cognizant of making asks of community members or liaisons to communities um, that uh, there's already a lot going on and um, you want to be meeting them where they're at and if this is a time that um, it's too much to to make an ask of then uh, being able to find another way to support them through this process and kind of pulling that up into the, the larger engagement and um, opinion collection process. I don't know if that formed a complete thought, but I can I can simmer no, more on it. No, it, it definitely it definitely does, and I would love to incorporate that you know a trauma informed perspective and approach into community engagement. I have to say I I am privy to the conversations around communications and community engagement, and Hana has been very focused on is this the time. Can, can we make an ask, right? Is this, she, she's, she's been very sensitive to that. So I, I um, I'm saying yes and yay. <laughs> Hannah has been bringing that approach. So we'll, we'll add that in there. Thank you so much, Abe. Anyone else would love Dr. Bill. Can we unmute? Forgot. 
but I, I think sort of following up on what Abe just said, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I uh, was looking at the principle around best practices for community engagement, I think that's another area where I'm not sure what best practice means in terms of how high level it might, th those principles might be or how specific they might be. But in the COVID-19 environment, it seems to me that how we go about community engagement is going to look entirely different from what it might have been, you know, six months ago. So it might be good to incorporate some language that acknowledges that best practices uh, is, I think, now a relative thing uh, given COVID-19. And, and I think we should address that so that people know that we are thinking about the fact that community engagement will probably look different and, and should be different um, in this environment. Yes. And I'm sure that Hannah will be asking you for ideas, opinions, thoughts around that. And so that we can flesh that out. So I appreciate that so much. We will include that. And what does the new best practices look like? Beautiful. Yes, Park. Uh, just a tiny thing um, on, on the charter. The uh, last sentence in the background refers to the National Environmental Policy Act. And after that, it's just, it's just the initials that are used. So there should be a, the initials and brackets after the National Environmental Policy Act. Very good. I'll make that change. Do, the, do does everyone feel um, clear on what the charter is? How 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 you should work together? The the things that we want to accomplish. Is everybody clear on that? Can I have a thumbs up? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Um. That's fantastic. I, I'm so glad that you are comfortable with this charter. Um, with these changes, I'll send it back out. And then next month, we'll go ahead and vote to adopt it. So I am really glad to be able to bring this forward, that you feel comfortable with it, and that by adding these other bullets, that'll, that'll be a great charter for all of us to work from and to move through the work with. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So then our next stop is with ODOT. So again, I'm going to share my screen for a little bit and I'm going to ask that um, Cooper Brown um, be promoted, Brett. Is Cooper here? coming online now. Ah, very good, okay. Hi, Cooper. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well, Christine. How are good. you? Good, good. Okay, so um, I am gonna share my screen just super quick to be able to introduce you. Um, so, uh, Cooper Brown is the Assistant Director of Operations for ODOT, for the Oregon Department of Transportation, and he would like to um, begin the work by acknowledging the inequities in transportation planning and implementation. So again, I'm going to stop my screen. I'm going to invite you to take the floor, Cooper. Great. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, everyone. Uh, pleasure to see your faces. Uh, some of you, I think I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you I haven't. Um, really appreciate the time today uh, that you're giving me to come and, and talk to you. I'll, I'll keep it brief and you uh, already kind of hit the high points, Christine, uh, in terms of the themes of what I'll say. Um, but uh, a little bit about, about me. I'm Cooper Brown. I'm the Assistant Director for Operations uh, for the Department of Transportation. 
Uh, and so in that capacity, I oversee a handful of divisions within the department. Uh, so think of the folks that maintain our transportation system, that do the paving, uh, that do the projects. That division sits underneath me, as does uh, our team that interfaces with the public transportation providers around the state, um, the folks that, uh, that think about rail, uh, all of those folks uh, sit within my group, as well as uh, a new climate office that ODOT has established uh, just a handful of months ago, uh, and also the urban mobility office, which is relevant in this conversation because uh, it is the office uh, from which Lucinda uh, and Hannah and others are, are, are working, and really where this work is situated, this project is situated. Uh, and that's a new office as well. Uh, and I wanted to stop there for a minute and, and explain to you a little bit of the rationale for why we established that office, uh, the urban mobility office, that is. So it was really with an eye towards uh, recognizing that as a department, the way we've done our business in the past, um, to, I guess to be quite blunt, uh, we needed to do it differently. Uh, we needed to think more kind of comprehensively, more holistically, especially around big projects uh, that are that have significant significant impacts to the system. Uh, by and large, most of those are in the Portland region uh, right now. So think Rose Quarter, think the uh, I-5 bridge, think tolling. Uh, the big projects that have huge impacts on Oregonians and on the region in general, the big projects that have a lot of uh, political sensitivity, the big projects where we really have to um, put people first and engage the communities in ways that we, we maybe haven't in the past. Um, so that's really the intent of this office. And this is one of the first kind of forays into that space. And you are one of those, uh, you're, you're part of that foray really. Uh, and so I, I wanna say thank you for that. Um, appreciate you joining us with, uh, with this work because we do feel it's really important. Um, I guess the big thing I wanted to, to, to speak to uh, today is really on the, uh, on the recognition that the way that we've done, and it goes into some of my previous comments on urban mobility, but the way that we've done a lot of our work uh, as a department um, has created harm. So I wanna be really explicit about that. Uh, ODOT has had made decisions in the past that have created uh, a good deal of harm. Uh, they've, created, um, th they've created displacement for uh, folks, segregation for folks, uh, primarily communities of color have been impacted in negative ways. Um, those very communities that we're, we're trying to serve. Uh, and so we recognize as a department uh, that we have to do better and be more intentional in this space. Um, you know, we have to, we have to incorporate restorative justice uh, in our practices. Uh, we have to have that really as a touchstone for everything we do moving forward. Um, and I guess, you know, <laughs> putting myself in your shoes and probably some other folks in the region, uh, it's one thing to say that, it's really uh, another thing to do it. Um, talk is cheap at the end of the day and our actions matter and really how we actually deliver it is going to be um, pardon the bad pun, but where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so um, we really have to make sure that, that we're delivering in, in meaningful kind of concrete ways um, that impact in the right way those communities that we've uh, at times harmed with our decisions in the past. So uh, really think that y'all are at the cutting edge of this as the EMAC, um, and that's why we've established the group. Uh, that's why we wanted uh, y'all to be in from really the ground floor. Um, and be part of the conversations to help guide us uh, and to help make sure that our actions are consistent with our values in the space, right? And that we really are uh, impacting, impacting communities in the way we intend. Um, so following on some of the comments that you made, Christine, I guess the way that I see uh, kind of the key elements in the project and the things that I think we really need to hit uh, collectively as we move forward in this, uh, I mentioned restorative justice. I think that has to be a core, core element of this work. Um, those folks who have been involuntarily displaced, um, those folks who have been underserved by some of our past decisions have to be brought front and center in real ways, meaningful ways. Uh, I think there needs to be a mobility focus. I think that's going to be critical in the way that we do tolling. Uh, we have to look at how we can draw connections um, between modes uh, in ways that are intentional and deliberate, um, that increase resources for the folks that are using our system. Uh, we have to address climate change. Uh, that's really, uh, as we elevate equity uh, and considerations around equity into everything we do, simultaneously as a department, we're trying to elevate um, climate change and, and trying to really address carbon emissions and reduce those in meaningful, consistent ways. Have that as a, uh, 
is one of the fundamental lenses through which we do all our work. So I think that's, that's, that's important here in this space as well. So I'd ask that as you, as you move forward, you keep those considerations in mind. Uh, and of course, consider health and safety um, and all those things that are, that are really important. Um, so I guess those would be the, the, the high points of the, the kind of important areas of focus that I would uh, hope uh, the group is uh, centering on. Uh, and I guess a key element is really the, the uh, community input in the space. I mean, y'all talked about it a little bit and I appreciated the comments and the recognition that, you know, what community input looks like and how we gathered it uh, even six months ago is different than, than how we might need to do it now. So that's a great point. Um, I guess the other thing I'd want to leave you with is for ODOT, uh, as, we, as we kind of collectively navigate this space, uh, I want to commit to you all that we're going to be transparent with you uh, in the way that we use your feedback. So one of the things that I hear a lot uh, is, and I think it's part of the reason that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, some folks distrust government is because um, we'll, we'll sometimes ask for input, and we'll solicit your input, uh, and then you won't hear how that was used, right? You feel like it goes into the machine, and what comes out is something that looks drastically different than what you thought, uh, and you, you're left asking those questions, huh? So I spent my time um, providing input for, for what end. So I wanna make sure that we're uh, committing to you that as you give us your time and your energy, your passion in this space, uh, that we will give back to you input on how those decisions uh, are being made and how that input is feeding into it. Um, so I guess those were the, the high points I wanted to make sure I hit. And one is a thank you, two is a recognition that we have to do things better, more intentionally. Uh, Y'all's work is a part of that. Uh, and three is that, that commitment for transparency. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions if folks have them. Uh, also happy to turn it over to, uh, to Lucinda. Um, not sure exactly, Christine, how, how best you want to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank yeah. you. This is great. Yeah, open the floor for questions. That would be wonderful. So Cooper, um, how, how do you envision restorative justice centered in this work? Um, well, I guess I, I view it as this, the key pieces of it are uh, soliciting uh, feedback from those folks who have not been either their, their input uh, was never solicited or to my last comment, it was solicited uh, and it's been given, but not actually incorporated in a meaningful way. So I, I think part of it, to my mind, is really um, the kind of planning, <coughs> excuse me, and strategy around who do we who do we ask for input. Uh, but then, really, I think in some ways that's the easy part. Uh, the harder part is is making sure that the process works right, and, and the cogs turn is turned by that input uh, in ways that's, that's significant and meaningful. And I, I don't want to sound too kind of theoretical, but um, that's just kind of the, what comes to mind uh, in this space. So I think it's, it's really a part of making sure that we're, um, we're addressing those communities that are going to be impacted, that we expect will be impacted, that have been negatively impacted in the past, uh, and making sure they're brought into the, into the space uh, in, a, in a fulsome kind of non-superficial way. That kind of are the key elements to me. But does that answer your question, Christine? Mm -hmm. Yep, it sure does. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Michael. Hi, uh, Christine, thanks for asking that, that question. Um, Cooper, thanks for being here. I wanted to follow up on the climate office and could you share a little bit about how you um, sort of expect or what the intention is for the climate office to impact different projects and, and programs? And I think I'm just sort of recognizing that a lot of times projects tend to have like a forward momentum. So when does the climate office sort of have a chance to, to influence or like how will that sort of be deployed? It's a great question. Uh, and I guess the short answer is uh, we're working through some of that, uh, some of the mechanics and kind of procedures. Uh, the office itself has only been stood up uh, for about six months uh, and it's coming from, uh, as I mentioned, kind of a recognition over uh, much longer than that, that we needed to be more kind of intentional in this space. We needed to elevate the climate lens, if you will, um, more intentionally. So we've created an office uh, that uh, reports directly to me. Uh, we've staffed it. Prior to that, we had climate kind of 
as a subordinate part of the organization. Um, the intent was there, but it, it really didn't have the, the oomph, if you will, to actually kind of uh, delve into some of these spaces uh, and, and make sure that, that we were using that climate lens, if you will. So I think with the governor's uh, recent executive order uh, on um, statewide transportation strategy implementation, uh, some of the uh, kind of clear direction we've gotten from, from the legislature and from, from the governor in this space, uh, we're looking to do a lot of things. We're looking to you know, first and foremost, um, make sure that as we design projects, uh, we're assessing the emissions impacts uh, and making sure that we're uh, incorporating uh, components that can mitigate those, right? Uh, we're looking at um, how, how we invest our money uh, to parts of the system that might be impacted disproportionately by climate change. So just think extreme weather and those types of things. Uh, as folks probably know, you know, there's there's more need than there is money, uh, and so making sure that uh, those considerations are, are factored into kind of the strategic way that we invest is important important element of it. Uh, and then there's uh, obviously a lot of work on the promoting electric vehicle use, um, thinking through, uh, and some of this is happening in conjunction with some of our our sister agencies, if you will, or partner agencies. Um, how do we how do we get more uh, EV charging stations and infrastructure um, around the state, and where do we need those, and how do we make sure that those are actually serving? I mean, there's an equity component to that too, right? How do we make sure that those are actually serving um, everyone, uh, and and not just, uh, frankly, rich white people that live in single-family dwellings? So, to be blunt, so um, so I mean, that's what we're doing. Um, it's a uh, work in progress, and um, we're excited about it. Uh, but you know, as we move into a space where we're where we're kind of putting more primacy on climate, uh, putting more intentionality and primacy on on equity, um, there's a lot of growth, uh, and a, and a probably iterations that we'll we'll learn from, and, and y'all are a part of that. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. There's certainly a lot of, you know, different elements. Um, that are that are vying for that time and attention. So thank you for putting your efforts towards them. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Dwight, I'd like to um, invite you to ask your question. Thank you, Christine. Um, good afternoon, Cooper. Um, I'm probably a little bit more blunt than most people. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, life is too short to, to dance around the maple. Um, and I appreciate you acknowledging ODOT's uh, past uh, transgressions, um, but I asked the question um, acknowledging what Dr. King believed that uh, privileged people rarely give up their privileges voluntarily and without strong resistance. And so my question is, um, what is different about ODOT now than, um, you know, 50 years ago or whenever, when, you know, I guess I'm not from here, so I, I feel very comfortable uh, in, in talking about this. Uh, I don't have a history here in Oregon, but I, I certainly have a history as, a, as an African American in this country. And so I asked the question, how long ago uh, were these transgressions and uh, what is different now? What has changed? Who has changed uh, uh, that is going to usher in a new day uh, for ODOT and thus the, the, the folks that were so uh, ill affected by uh, the past uh, uh, you know, planning and, and everything that else went, went into that. So I just asked that straightforward. You may not have the answer to that, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Thank I you. appreciate it, Dwight. It's a great question. Uh, so I don't know if I have the full answer, but I have a answer. Uh, and I'll I I'll give it to you. Um, so really, to be more explicit, uh, when, I, when I point to some of those past arms, uh, the one that's top of mind for me is really thinking about um, I-5 construction through, um, through the Albina community uh, in Portland and some of the displacement that was caused there. Uh, and obviously ODOT was a, um, a central player in that. Uh, not to say we were the only player in that. Uh, and, and that happened you know, back in late 50s, early 60s, uh, I can't recall off, off the top of my head. Uh, and certainly we weren't the only spot in the country that has had that kind of history. Um, but it was 
prevalent. And I think it points to the fact that we weren't, um, we weren't taking into consideration the views and needs of the entire scope of our community that we're to serve, right? Um, so that was really, so just to be more explicit, the, the example that was coming to mind when I made that comment, uh, I guess to your question about what's changed, uh, well, I think a, a lot has changed. I think a lot is changing uh, in the moment. Uh, I think we're in a really exciting kind of cultural moment uh, in this space. Uh, I guess more to the point and explicit about this moment with ODOT, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we have a, a new director um, who came on board uh, late last year, uh, Director Strickler. Uh, and it was really through Director Strickler and through our commission, um, you know, to your point that uh, I can't re recall exactly how you said it or how, how uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it, but you know, power, <laughs> folks are um, loath to release power. Uh, you're right, usually there's a forcing function there, right? Uh, and, and that's true. And I'd say, I guess in this case, um, there's probably cultural forcing functions. Uh, there's also the change in leadership that we have with Director Strickler. There's a, um, a kind of increased focus from our commission uh, around making equity front and center for everything that we do as a department, given our history. And so how that's manifested itself, uh, just real kind of operationally, uh, is when Director Strickler came aboard, he, he developed a, a whole um, four, actually, assistant director position. So a whole kind of uh, level of leadership within the department underneath him and between the, the divisions. My role is one of those. And really the intent for, for my role is to try to synchronize and coordinate uh, what were, some would say, uh, disparate decisions that were made uh, really along the lines of kind of highway investments versus transportation investments, or sorry, versus uh, public transit investments, um, really kind of synchronize and horizontally integrate. Uh, additionally, one of the other assistant director positions, so right underneath the director, uh, is a social equity assistant director. Um, Nikotris Perkins came on board uh, three months ago in the midst of COVID, uh, in the midst of us teleworking, so uh, I don't envy her. Uh, and it's one of the first positions in, uh, of a state agency at that level um, that's focused on equity. Um, now, we have to do more than just have positions. We have to do more than just kind of uh, create more forums. We actually have to make sure that all of this work trickles down into uh, felt and real impacts for the communities that we're trying to, to bring front and center. So I'd say we're early in that stage, um, but we have made concrete strides uh, in Director Strickler and, and our commission in particular to focus on that. I guess the other thing I would flag is we are in the process as a department of refining our, uh, our strategic action plan. And I know that that'll turn off anybody who's not already turned off, um, start talking about strategic action plans, but uh, we are focusing on three key priority, priority areas. Um, equity being one of those, modernizing our transportation system, and then looking at kind of sustainable funding. How do we do anything? Because we can't do anything, obviously, without, without funding. Um, so in the past, we've had equity as something that was incorporated and something we considered um, for sure. And I, I don't want to be dismissive of that uh, as a department. But I think now we are, we are giving more um, centrality to it. Uh, we're bringing it forward in ways that have more clout, uh, in ways that kind of force folks to uh, make those considerations uh, across the board on our decisions, whether it be investing, whether it be project development, um, all those spaces. So I don't know if that really answers your question, and I'm sure there's there's lots more that uh, that could be said, but that's my stab, Dwight. Well, you you did a good job with a, a difficult uh, difficult question, but I I'll go back to what you said. The proof is in the pudding, and uh, I for one am waiting to uh, partake of that pudding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well said. Well said. Thank you so much, Cooper, and so much. Thank you so much, Dwight, for that that question. Anybody else? Open the floor here. Well, I guess I'll let you off the hot seat. <laughs> it is so nice to meet you. P pleasure to meet you, Christine, and, and again, really a sincere, genuine thank you for uh, stepping into the space with us and trusting us uh, enough to give us your time uh, and your energy and your, your passion and compassion and all of that. So really, thank you very much. I look forward to maybe coming back if, if Lucinda will allow it. <laughs> thank you, and, and, it, and it's, a, it's a real treat to be able to work with Nakatris too. So it's one yes, of the <laughs> I have lots to learn. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Take care, y'all.
All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my, my screen. And um, I'm going to uh, now ask Lucinda to give us a project overview. Sure. So just tell me to advance this slide, Lucinda. Not a problem. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I'm just going to do an overview of the I-205 project. I'll mention some things about I-5, but I think really it's going to be concentrated on I-205. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide, because this just says I'm going to do an overview. <laughs> so it's why are we doing toll projects at all? That's really a question. Um, and, and I'll say it this way. Why are we doing congestion relief projects? Why are we doing value pricing projects? And they all equal to why are we doing toll projects? All the same thing. So why? We have congestion. Um, and tolls have been used as, and people call it tolls, tolling, congestion pricing, value pricing. Um, variable pricing is, is just a form of tolls. So we're going to we're going to put it right down and in front of people, we're talking about tolls. Um, and tolls have been used to manage congestion and they have been very successful in the past. So we are, we are actually a lessons learned and we're joining the group basically. Um, you know, so it's congestion and it's funding. You know, gas tax are, are dwindling. Road, uses char road user charge We'll take some of that and use it for roads that we have. But when you're talking about building a bridge, adding some lanes, trying to trying to manage congestion, you're talking about tolling. It's it's a user fee basically. Um, you can see that last bullet saying that we were directed by the legislature um, to do this in House Bill 2017. You want to go to the next slide because I think that gives a little bit more. There we go. So after House Bill 2017, um, there was a value pricing feasibility study done and it's same analysis and they did lots of analysis, but I think the ideal was, yes, you need to toll, that's what the legislature said. I, and this group was, where should that tolling be and what should it look like? So they convened this group, value pricing feasibility, study analysis group and what they did was they studied many different it, it's it's almost like all of these alternatives and we're going to talk about alternatives probably for the next year and a half two years um, alternatives what does it look like if i put a toll gantry uh, to collect tolls at this point versus this point what does that mean and then what's the schema if i just collect a toll for someone crossing a bridge or if I do something like I collect a toll because you cross the bridge and then I move it up a little to an intersection. So I kind of segment the toll. What does all of that look like? So they brought together a lot of regional stakeholders, agency partners, and the public. They received 13, over 1,300 comments. Um, and they specifically looked at I-205 at the portion where it's Oregon City and Westland. So that was what the study kind of came out with after all of the work that they did. So what were the things that they heard? Um, equity, right? Equity and tolling, which is why you guys were convened for sure. Um, improved transit and other modes of transportation. How do people get around if they, if they can't afford the toll? Is there some other way to use the system? And then diversion. Um, what happens when people don't want to pay the toll and they roll through somebody else's neighborhood? What does that look like? And then where does that happen at? So this study kind of did that big look at all of that to distill it down to what you'll hear, um, I think not today because I don't think it's in here, but definitely you'll talk about the five alternatives that it came down to. I'm going to go to the next slide. So I'm going to start with, I know we've, uh, you guys have heard the word NEPA. I think we keep using it. National Environment, Environmental Policy Act. Um, that's where we're about to start. We're about to start the NEPA process. And it's asking us, it's saying, hey, why are you doing what you're doing? What's the purpose for that? What is the purpose for putting a toll on I-205? That's really the question we're going to start trying to answer now. 
um, starting August 3rd, actually, you'll see us come out with a public declaration of this is why we want to tow I-205. Here's the purpose and the need. So I will tell you the purpose statement has in it, what's the two reasons, congestion management and revenue generation. Those are the two that we're looking for. And then we talked about alternatives. When I said there will, there'll be five alternatives, you guys will probably see them over and over again for a while here. Um, they have to meet the purpose of the project. If they don't, it's pass fail. So if it, it's just pass fail. So all the analysis will be done. But if it doesn't meet the congestion management and the revenue generation, it fails. So that's, it's kind of, we're gonna come to you with the purpose and need statement, which I'm sure is next, if you can go to the next slide, which is improve congestion, generate net, uh, revenue. Those are the two, that's, that's why we're doing this project on I-205. Next slide. So I think we've, I, I don't know if we've shared this slide before, but we share this slide a lot. And it's basically, where does, where does your information go? How does it get to where it goes? And where are all the points where information is coming up to you and then going to the Transportation Commission? So you can see here, we have some technical groups at the bottom that we actually have. We have a regional modeling group that does all of those alternatives. They do all that analysis. So we have a regional modeling group. We have a transit and multimodal group that, that we actually support. And then we have, it's every other place that we may get something. All of our briefings, when we go out and give updates regarding the toll program, all of those things just bubble up to the next. So we're not keeping those comments just there. And we are receiving comments now. Um, we did a briefing last night and we received comments there. So those comments are, are moving their way up. And as you can see, the next one is the level where you are and it's direct to the commission. So your comments, your recommendations will go straight to the commission. Um, and of course it said to support, I think in your charter, uh, Christine has support the ODOT staff and uh, commission. So there are some things that we might be able to do just on the project side and we can accomplish those. And then there are other things that the Transportation Commission will have to make the determination on. But even the public comments go there. So all comments go up. Um, next slide. Oh, I give it over to Hannah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, what if we stop there? What if I stop sharing and That's we ask good. questions? That's good. Yeah. Questions? There is a lot more information. I will tell you that that was just surface. That was definitely an overview. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot more, there's a lot more information um, those analyses, you probably want to talk to the folks who do them and you want to see what they look like. We did do a data share with our regional partners. So we provided all the data we've used for the modeling. We gave them, showed them how we use the model, and then we gave them the recommendations. So it's not like we did it in a vacuum and we said, here's the ones we think. We said, no, here's how we got there. So um, we've done at least one workshop so far with Clackamas County regarding that data, what it looks like for them, and any questions they may have, and they can run the data themselves also. But there's a whole lot more. <laughs> questions? I'm getting off the hook easy. I like this. Okay, I'm going to turn you over to Hannah. I have a quick question. Are we driving folks to watch a recording of of um of the presentation that was at the region region one act was that on that slide okay did everybody catch that the the link that was there okay just making sure i guess we're that's good. communications for you it's <laughs> yours <laughs> thank you guys thank you lucinda appreciate that i'm going to go ahead and share my screen um so welcome hana hi all right, I, I have some notes here because we're, we're doing a lot and I don't wanna forget anything. So um, last time I was here, I gave a quick kind of 
update on what we were doing. And so now I wanted to come back and do, do a deeper dive of our engagement for the tool projects um, and, and talk specifically about what we're doing to engage folks for our I-205 um, tool projects public comment period that, as Lucinda mentioned, is kicking off on August 3rd. It'll be 45 days and it goes through September 16th. Um, so want to make sure that you guys know what what we're thinking about what we have planned and then leave space for for us to talk about you know those new best practices um and and just some ideas so that we can we can all work together and make sure that we're having really really meaningful engagement um so if there's ever a point where you know you're hearing something or you don't see something and you have some questions or you are you thinking oh i wish I wish Hannah would have spoken more about this or she didn't talk about this. Just let me know and we'll, we'll follow up and get you the information that you need to do your job. Okay, so let's see. So that first, that first bullet, Lucinda mentioned the value pricing feasibility analysis. And we, we kind of talk about this a lot. This is, you know, this is a, a big part of the engagement. Um, kind of what we, we gathered from the feasibility analysis. You know, we heard those, those three things. Um, you know, are you thinking about how tolls will impact folks who happen to have a lower income? Are you looking at transit? Are you looking at, at, at options for people to, to get around? What's currently on the ground? What, what would be needed? Um, are you looking at diversion? We know that currently there is a lot of existing diversion. There's, you know, folks who are already diverting off the freeway and going onto the local system what impact are tolls going to make on that existing diversion as they're going to be are there going to be other community impacts that would happen because of tolls so those are really the three things that we heard over and over and over again from many different many different folks and um you know those 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 comments we shared them um with the group that lucinda mentioned the policy advisory group uh we shared them with odot leadership we shared them with the Ogun Oregon Transportation Commission and those those comments became priorities for the project we're continuing to to put them um, as a focus in the project and like we said to mention you know they were a big part of how this group uh, was created why it was created we thought these are some big questions we're gonna need some help so thank you for being here um, so I, I share this with you because I think it's really important and it's a great example to show you um, that your comments and input matter and that they really do they sometimes they really do impact a project and um, so this is a really good example of that that two-way engagement of us putting information out about a project and then getting information back in hearing from folks and then us you know doing our due diligence to to pass your comments on to decision makers and sometimes it makes its way into the project and, and sometimes it doesn't but then it's but your comment has a voice and it's our job to let you know um, what happens with your comments so we're making that commitment to you that we'll we'll let you know what what, what happens with your comment and, and you know pass it pass it along so I just wanted to share that before we really jump into to our engagement so are you guys ready to talk engagement Okay. Okay. So I'm dividing it into two things uh, that that information out and then that information back in. So for information out, um, we have monthly newsletters that go out really telling people about our projects. If you haven't signed up for them yet, you should. I think they're great. Uh, we have media releases, a fact sheet. We are on social media right now. It's Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We have a great website. There's a lot of information on there and a resource library. There's an frequently asked questions document that's on there. We have videos. These are new. We're excited about them. And then we are, we really are sending out almost monthly emails to our partners. These are community partners, the regional partners, um, giving them an update on the project and kind of giving them a heads up. We sent an email out earlier this week letting them know about this meeting. So if they were available, they could they could attend. So that that's the information out. That's currently what we're doing. 
I also should have started this conversation kind of with the preface that uh, this strategy is, and this is our COVID strategy. So this is our virtual engagement strategy. It, it, you know, it was tweaked. We're not, we're not on the ground right now. So we had to kind of change it up a little bit. Um, for getting information in, we are going out and doing briefings. We're really talking to as many folks as possible. I don't think Lucinda's had a night off since, I don't know, probably since you started. <laughs> um, sometimes, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes it's two or three in a day. So we're going out and talking to um, boards and councils and county coordinating committees and region, regional policy groups. I mean, anyone who really wants to talk tolls, we're, we're there. Um, we have webinars and presentations. I, I gave a presentation to the Westland Scouts at the, I don't know, the beginning of May and they had some good questions about tolls. Um, so we're, we're open. Anyone who wants a presentation, we're, we're trying to get out there. Um, we have discussion groups. This is more of a focused conversation. It's a much smaller group and lets us kind of dive in to, you know, four or five questions and really hear what people think about the project. Um, we have surveys and questionnaires that we use. And then we have our engagement that's really intentionally trying to reach uh, those communities that are either currently or historically have been underserved and or underrepresented by transportation projects. And for this work, we're working really closely with Ping Ka. Do, does anyone on this group know Ping? Ping, is, uh, Ping has a community engagement liaison program. And she is helping us reach the Latinx, Russian, Vietnamese, and Chinese communities. So we work with Ping and the community, community engagement liaisons. Um, they also do, a, they're also doing some of the translation for our project materials. So this is just a really great partnership. And I feel really fortunate that Ping is on our team because not only is Ping and the community engagement liaisons you know, they're, they're working closely with us, so they learn about the projects, but then they're translating the materials, so they're really in the materials, they, you know, they, they, they get the projects, and then they're the actual folks who go out into communities that we really wouldn't be able to reach on our own. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's, that's a really great asset for our engagement. In addition to working with the cells, we are also working with NEA to reach the Native American communities. And then I don't think, I don't think Jermaine is here tonight, but um, we, we're reaching out to some of our very local um, expertise on this committee. And um, we're gonna work with Jermaine to kind of pick his brain and see what he recommends for reaching black communities in the Portland metro area. So that's kind of a, a broad overview of what we currently have planned. Now I'm gonna jump into what we're doing for the comment period, but I just kind of wanted to pause because I just talked a lot. I'll stop sharing real quick. <laughs> In case anybody has questions or comments about the engagement process so far. Okay. Uh, Christine. Okay. Oh no, uh, Dr. Will. Yep. Yeah. So so Hannah, um, along the lines of uh, of uh, the, the 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 comment that I made earlier when we were talking about uh, guiding principles around community engagement, what 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 kind of steps are you going to be taking uh, to reach those various communities? Given the fact that just about everything we're doing is virtual, I mean, how are you going to reach those communities in a in a really meaningful way. I mean, logistically, physically, you know, that kind of thing. That's the million dollar question. That is, you know, I think everybody's trying to figure that out. Um, and we're looking for, you know, if you have any ideas right now, what we're doing is we've been doing um, outreach to community based organizations. We've been making phone calls. Um, and we kind of see this as like a, this is a we're gonna be doing this throughout the length of the project. This isn't just, you know, 
for a month or two months. Um, the idea got started with COVID that, you know, we need to check in with folks. We can't just send them an email and ask them to sh shoot some materials out, or we can't just, you know, show up to an event anymore because they might not have one. So um, what we're doing is we are reaching out to folks and just starting relationships. We're, we're interviewing them. We're talking to them. We're asking them. We're asking them what should we be doing. Um, is like Christine said, like, is this the right time to be talking about tolling? Have you heard about our project? Um, what's your recommendation? Are, what are you doing? How are you serving your communities? What are some opportunities for us to plug into that? Um, so, I mean, it's been really challenging if I'm being completely honest. Like I wasn't able to speak to a person until maybe Three weeks ago, I started getting calls back and we've been making calls for a long time. Um, so it's, I will say it's changing. I, I will say like I'm starting to speak to more folks and now it's not just even leaving a voicemail and somebody calling you back. It's people are picking up the phone. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited about that. So to answer your question, we're, we're asking. We're asking different community-based organizations what the best way to engage them is. Mm -hmm. And Great, a lot thank of you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Hey, thank you so much for that. Great question. Uh, Diana, I can invite you to. Yeah, thank mute. you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I didn't hear any reference to how um, engagement will happen with our visual, uh, hearing and visually impaired communities. Um, I am wondering um, about that type of, what, what does that engagement look like? What have been the efforts up to this point? And then my second question, um, as the engagement is occurring with um, uh, culturally specific CBOs for engagement with uh, culturally specific BIPOC communities, what I have learned in this COVID environment is that um, there are some, even in, even in um, uh, urban settings, there is the gap of uh, the technology, uh, a digital gap that exists. And if we are relying on um, some of this technology, um, as a way to engage, what has been the conversation around mitigating those, those digital and technology gaps that perhaps, um, whether it's the one-on-one -on -one engagement with, with community, but also the reality is that there are some culturally specific CBOs or even just CBOs in general who don't have the infrastructure um, in terms of that technology um, to engage communities. I'm wondering what has been the conversation around that. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Those, those are such great questions. And, um, you know, this is a new space for us. So we're continuing to learn about that. Um, we have, we have had a lot of conversations. We've been um, looking to our community engagement liaisons to kind of tell us what they recommend for the different communities that they're working with. And so there have been a lot of conversations, you know, it's not a one size fits all kind of approach. Um, so, I mean, we, we learned that um, for some folks, um, using text message is a, a really good option. Um, we got the idea to use saying that Skype was a good option, other folks saying no, uh, Zoom, Zoom is better. Um, we heard some feedback that conference calls could be, could be a good option. Um, and then we, we also learned that, um, you know, it, there really isn't a good alternative to, to in-person outreach. So we might need to scale it down and have smaller groups, like maybe even just like a one-on-one -on -one phone call, um, or maybe just two people on a phone call. So we're learning, you know, we're, we're still asking the questions and getting feedback. Um, so that's, that's some of the information that we have and Ping and the community engagement liaisons, they're, they're putting those methods into action. 
And I'm, I'm going to have to get back to you on the different tools that we have for, um, for reaching folks that are visually and, hear and hearing impaired. I know we have captions on, on our videos. Um, I'm sure we have other stuff and, and this is also a good, you know, just a good check for me to, to learn more about this. Diana, you have another question. Thank you for that, Hannah. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. No. Um, I'm, I'm wondering also about in this current environment, as many families are experiencing economical hardship, and as we're learning this impending new stimulus um, uh, relief that is coming from DC and the reduction from the $600 a month to potentially $200 a month. Um, I, it makes me wonder about, you know, the, the, the overall hardship that families are going to be enduring because of that reduction. And as we're talking about tolling, it makes me wonder, is it, it, is it really the right time to be talking about this, one, and two, as, as, as many of us, uh, you know, community stakeholders, many a times we are paid by our organizations or receive a monetary stipend to participate in these, in these types of discussions. It makes me wonder about um, incentivizing um, participation specifically from our communities who are experiencing economical hardships. Um, has there been any conversation centered around that? Um, so two, two things in that question. One, um, the time, is this the time to talk about tolling? Um, so we, we have been sending questionnaires out and making those calls um, and asking those questions. Um, you know, some, some folks haven't gotten back to me, so maybe it's not the right time. Um, but I have heard from other folks, they, you know, they have heard about the project and, you know, we do have this comment period that is happening and the project is moving forward. So I try to kind of fill out what is, you know, what is the best way to make sure that we're getting information to folks and what are, what are the options that we have for getting information back? That's kind of the approach that that I've been taking. Um, and the second part of your, the second part of your question um, was about paying people for their, just like thinking about the value of their time and their experience. And um, we do, we, we are um, compensating folks for that are participating in, um, you know, our, um, our, um, our discussion groups. And we do, um, our discussion groups and we, I think we also have like a few I'll have to follow up with you to get the details but um, that is something that that, that we think about um, some type of you know um, some way to appreciate the time and expertise that people are providing you know especially if it's going to take them take time out of their day and limited resources to be able to provide that information so let me get back to you specifically with, with what's in the scope. Park. Park. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just unmuting. Takes me a moment here. Um, no problem. Yeah, I've joked with some of my friends about why we're talking about tolling right now, but uh, in my mind, it's it is a good time to talk. The decisions are not going to be made. Um, and I don't know the exact timeline, but uh, probably in 2002 or 2022. Um, so the hopefully the COVID will uh, incident will be over by then, and we can be reevaluating what traffic is like. And you know, we dream about business being back to normal sometime in that period. So. Um, it's just, I, I think it is time to be talking. If, if we were voting on whether to 
do it or not today, it'd be a different discussion. But that's going to happen far in the future or, or not too far in the future. Thank you, Park. Anna, you have more? I do have a little bit more. How am I doing on time? You're doing great. You're doing great. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Can I share with you kind of what, what we have planned for the I-205 public comment period, how to, how to get the word out on that, and then love to hear, you know, you guys have some, some ideas. Okay, so we have a, um, we have a website and it's, it's basically an online open house and on that website is also a survey and then there are videos. And so um, the, the website and the videos and that survey, it's available in Spanish and in English and that's gonna go live on August 3rd. And um, in addition to that, oh, there's a little, a little image right there. And then in addition to that, we have a six page fact sheet that is comprehensive, but accessible. And it has all the information that you would need to be able to um, take the survey. So we have that six page fact sheet, the survey, and then we have a one page flyer. And that flyer really is the, um, the hi, we're having a, a, a public comment period. It's 45 days. Here's how you can participate and here's why it's important that you do. Um, so we have that flyer, the fact sheet, the survey, and those materials are available in Spanish, Russian, simplified Chinese, Vietnamese, and English. Famous. Yes. Um, so we have those materials. Then we are doing three webinars. So in the month of August, we'll have a webinar on the 12th, the 18th, and the 20th. And we're doing them at different times of the day to try to reach different audiences. Um, then I kind of mentioned this earlier, but we're continuing to call community-based organizations, seeing what they have planned, if we can plug into that, and also, um, you know, putting putting a voice to the name that they see in the email, that's sending them emails and asking them um, to share our notifications or our materials. If, you know, if it's the right fit to, to drop it into a newsletter or maybe a website or a social media post. We are using Facebook. Uh, we also have ads that are gonna run on Facebook and we have printed ads as well in community papers. We're gonna be posting ads in um, Oregon City News, El Latino de Hoy, The Asian Reporter, The Scanner, and The Portland Observer. We're working with Ping and the Community Engagement Liaisons. They are gonna go out and use that, that fact sheet and the survey, put information out, have folks take the survey, bring it back. Um, and then continuing to provide those briefings and go out and talk to people. So boards, councils, policy groups. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, um, see if you have more questions. Oh, but first I'm, I'm going to ask you just um, if you, you know, we'll, we'll send you this information and if you can help us expand our reach and um, send this information out to your networks and your communities so we can really um, get more input input from and comments from many different folks. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Because I have one. <laughs> Can this committee take those surveys, watch those videos and their comments be included? Included what? Included in, in this process, in, in the 45 day process. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I just want to make sure that everybody's invited to participate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anyone can participate in the comment period. Send it to your friends, your family. That sounds good. <laughs> Light scintillating conversation at dinner. Yes. <laughs> But I appreciate the opportunity to participate, Hannah. This is great. Thank you. And Amy, I, I know Amy. this is just the beginning of talking about engagement. And, you know, I look forward to, you know, workshopping this with everyone and continuing to kind of like fine tune this. And like Abe said, really 
figure out what those new best practices are. So let me know. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be, uh, if I can get my mouse to come back. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry about that. Um, Chris Lippy is an independent equity expert and consultant on this project. He was one of the architects on the equity framework. And so I am going to ask Brett to promote Chris Lippy. Um, Chris, are you here yet? Yes. Hey Yay. Up. Awesome. Okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> I am excited as well. <laughs> it's good to see you. Good All right. So you. just tell me when to advance the slides, OK? Well, we have one slide today, folks. So um, oh, no, you have two. You know, it's going to be a, well, we got this one and the, and the next one. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a very powerful slide. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so my name is, uh, is Chris Lepe, as uh, Christine mentioned, and um, I've been uh, prior to, to my role in a uh, new role starting actually effectively this week of kind of going at it alone in, in the consulting space. Um, I spent 15 years with a nonprofit organization called Transform based out of California that uh, is really focused on, on equity and climate uh, as it relates to transportation and land use and um, spent uh, basically all the time with that, or with that organization um, really trying to push the envelope um, as it relates to things like pricing, um, express lane implementation, uh, bus rapid transit implementation, land use planning, and, and so on and so forth. And um, now in the, in the context of this role, I've been uh, working on, on the ODOT uh, tolling project uh, since about 2000, uh, the, end of, the end of 2019. Um, the fall of 2019. Um, I'm also, by the way, working with Portland Metro on, uh, on their pricing study as well. So, um, you know, uh, the whole kind of reason why um, we were reached out to and why I came on board um, along with uh, a colleague of mine that uh, uh, had been working with me uh, at Transform uh, is uh, that ODOT wanted to incorporate you know, figure out how to incorporate equity into this project. Um, as already noted, it was a big uh, kind of issue in, um, in, in the community. And so uh, here we are um, a few months later, and I'm bringing to, to you today, um, giving you a little uh, uh, presentation about the equity framework that we've put together um, amongst uh, effectively what is an equity, uh, an equity team as part of this project. So what I'm gonna talk to you uh, about today give a little bit of context about why the framework was created, um, sort of where it came from, uh, what it is, uh, including the six organizing principles that were developed and the five-step process uh, that you'll see in my very powerful slide that is coming next. Um, and then how we, will, uh, how we will use it moving forward and then I uh, um, wanted to open up for a discussion. So I'm hoping um, my, uh, me speaking is gonna take about 10, 15 minutes, and then we can use um, the rest of the time. I believe we have about, um, after that, about somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes to, um, to, to discuss and to chew on this. Um, so does that sound good? Hopefully it sounds good. Um, okay. So I'm gonna dive into the uh, tech equity framework in terms of why we're doing this, right? So during the feasibility analysis, uh, there were really uh, strong recommendations that came from the policy advisory committee, from the OTC, and the public that the needs of communities of color um, and people with low incomes need to be addressed. And, um, and so the project team uh, that includes ODOT staff uh, and consultants proposed drafting an equity framework to give us a roadmap for integrating the equitable distribution of benefits and burdens in, um, into these toll projects. Um, the, fra the framework will guide the projects, uh, I-205 and I-5, to ensure both equitable outcomes um, and implementation of an intentional and equitable engagement process uh, that makes historic, historically underrepresented and underserved communities a priority. So key here, I think it's been mentioned before, but we're focused not just on the outcomes or the process, but both. 
um, as part of this being, being uh, fundamental. Um, the framework itself, if some of you uh, did your research, it cites uh, the report that we produced uh, with Transform, Pricing Roads Advancing Equity, so the 2019 report, so we produced it last year. Uh, so the framework is, is um, heavily influenced by that, uh, but it's also, uh, I must say, uh, infused with the, uh, the input and the ideas and the talents of the equity team uh, that is uh, composed of uh, some of the sort of leading experts in, in the area, um, in, in the Portland area and beyond as it relates to equity. So uh, um, I'm sort of, I'm very excited to bring this to you. Uh, this has been months in development. And um, although ODOT has reviewed it, we want to make sure that you guys are invested in this, that the committee uh, takes ownership of the framework, uses it in the context of this project, evaluates the effectiveness of it, and help, um, you know, we want you to help us adapt it and refine it over time. And in many ways, this document is the first of its kind, especially for uh, a statewide uh, agency like ODOT. And we're looking forward to hearing your feedback, um, as well as feedback from the community. We're hoping that you'll be able to share this out to your networks uh, to help bring in that input that we need um, to make it even stronger, um, as well as to, to create uh, buy-in, right, um, and ownership. So uh, how does this work? Um, so I mentioned six organizing principles. And, um, and I'll just briefly go uh, down the list of the six organizing principles. This is all featured in the um, in the framework document that was shared, which hopefully um, you all got a chance to read uh, before the meeting. But first uh, in line here is we want to make sure that we start with the racial analysis. We want to be explicit about race and systematic racism. And I think you've already seen that, um, you know, some initial comments from, from ODOT uh, staff today about that, really centering around race. Um, and we want to acknowledge the historic context. Again, I think you heard that acknowledgement today. Um, we want to make sure that communities that have been historically affected by the transportation system um, are acknowledged and involved directly in a meaningful way in the project development and follow-up. We want to identify disparities, um, and so we want to uh, make sure that we're looking at historical impacts as well as the distribution of uh, project benefits and burdens and pro provide remediation solutions where warranted. I think one thing that I, I, I want to kind of tease out is that uh, a lot of times when we think uh, sort of in the, in, in sort of the, the history of transportation planning, especially recently, well, before there was sort of explicit, as noted, uh, in some cases targeted racist actions, right? Um, or actions that had disproportionate impacts on communities of color and so on and so forth with, with really little regard uh, to, to the way that they're, they're being affected. Uh, and then we kind of entered this, this phase of uh, trying to make sure to the extent possible that we don't have too much in the way of negative impacts on, on, uh, on these communities, right? That's sort of like the environmental justice, national legislation that we had passed. Um, and a lot of what sort of NEPA is about is, is sort of protecting, avoiding impacts, right? Where we're trying to go, sort of the context, the idea, the overarching idea of this, of this approach, of this framework, is to not just try to mitigate and try to avoid impacts, but we're actually trying to maximize benefits for uh, communities of color, um, you know, historically underrepresented communities, and so on and so forth. So, um, I want I, I would want like to challenge us to think uh, over the course of this process, how can we disproportionately benefit, not just avoid disproportionate impacts, but benefit uh, these communities that um, have been left out and that have been impacted over time. Um, we also want to uh, make sure along with that, that we're prioritizing impact uh, input from impacted uh, communities, historically underrepresented and underserved communities. Uh, we want to attend to power dynamics among stakeholders. So this is, um, uh, I think, new and important where we want to recognize, understand, and um, shift existing power dynamics within ODOT, other government agencies, groups, the community, and the project team. So. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is, I think, going to um, challenge us, and um, I think it's, it's a good thing, right, to, to think about how decisions are made um, and how we can create uh, more accountability uh, effectively. Um, and then finally, the sixth learning principle is maintaining a learning orientation. Um, 
as noted, this is sort of uh, uh, very innovative nationally, um, as well as for ODOT. And um, it's really kind of a, a first step, a big first step for, for, for ODOT in, in, in some ways, um, both the tolling project as well as uh, a focus on uh, equity to this extent and in this way. And so um, it's important to note that the toll program is committing to letting equity drive its approach to the planning process, but also, you know, we'd like to invite everybody um, that is part of this process, including y'all, to, uh, to kind of use it as a space to, to, uh, to grow and to use it as collective learning um, and to kind of uh, hopefully we'll be able to adapt uh, with that learning over time. So um, now moving on to the five uh, steps of implementation. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the, the slide that I was really referring to in terms of um, the five steps. Um, and so just to kind of give you a, a, an overarching understanding of uh, what, we talk, what we're talking about in terms of the five steps. So um, step number one is really the project, uh, the project scope. Um, and it's, it's identifying the who, what, and where. So who, you know, who are we talking about when we're talking about the communities of, of concern, of interest, the historically uh, underserved and underrepresented communities? Uh, where do they live? Uh, where do they travel and um, and what is the project right what is the relation between the project and those communities um, and the sort of the services and needs that they have uh, where they need to go um, the second step is uh, then once you identify the project which might include for example where the tolls are located um, you then uh, you don't want to identify what the, uh, the the equity outcomes and performance measures that you're after, and so um, just like any project, it's important to state what the goals are, and then how are you going to measure those goals. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about some examples of that, um, and then what happens once you identify what those goals and uh, those outcomes and those performance measures are is you want to do an analysis of what are the implications. Um, in, in relation to those. So um, for example, does the project improve access to opportunity for uh, underserved, underrepresented communities? Does it increase affordability or take us in the opposite direction? And so on and so forth. Uh, then uh, once there is that analysis, you want to choose options that advance equity. What kind of strategies, what kind of actions can be taken, what kind of investments, for example, through the toll revenues can be um, uh, implemented in order to increase access, improve affordability, improve community health and safety, and so on and so forth. Um, important to note that this is, because we're talking about a program that's gonna move forward over the course of time with the collection of revenues, the investment of the revenues, the uh, you know, there, there's flexibility built in to, uh, to a strategy like this and a project like this and a need for iteration over time. So you can revisit these steps. You can, uh, and we encourage actually revisiting these steps in order to uh, kind of perfect, iterate over time, generating the community input, responding to that community input um, in order to uh, uh, end up with the, the best possible outcomes. And then, um, uh, related to uh, all of this is, is sort of hinting there is making sure that we have the accountable feedback and evaluation. So when, um, for example, a few years from now, the toll program is in effect and it's already had time to where we could start seeing what the uh, ramifications are, the implications um, for things like traffic, uh, uh, you know, access to jobs, um, affordability, you know, uh, so on and so forth, we report that back to the community. We get community feedback and input, and there's sort of that constant communication, ongoing communication over time, um, and then evaluation and iteration. So um, very different in some ways, in many ways, actually, from uh, just a pure, purely capital-oriented uh, project where a lot of times it's you build it and then move on. Um, so... I can go into further uh, specificity in regards to uh, things like outcome and process equity, um, de determining benefits and burdens, 
choosing options that advance equity and uh, accountable feedback and evaluation. But actually, I'd like to kind of stop and see um, at this point here whether that would be worthwhile for you um, or whether you would like to reserve more time for, uh, for conversation. Um, and, and maybe part of the question on my end is how many of you have actually um, had a chance to, to review the, uh, the framework? So if you can raise your hand if you've had a chance to, to review the draft framework. Okay, so we, we've got um, about maybe 60% or so. So maybe what I can do then is um, maybe uh, kind of hit on some of the, uh-huh. Uh, Diana has a question. She's got her hand up right away. Okay. Do you mind if, is that okay if she jumps in? Absolutely, no, yeah, yeah. We can take a pause right now and yeah. um, oh, oh, oh. it's been a You're lot of me talking, read, so. Okay. <laughs> I was just saying I read, that I read the framework. I, I didn't have any questions right now, but thank you, Christine. Okay, great. <laughs> well, so. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, Christine, for, uh, you know, uh, taking a pulse of the room. I mean, what would, would folks welcome a little bit of uh, me continuing to talk for a little bit and kind of uh, rolling through the five steps? Uh, or do you want to get into discussion? I, I feel like, you know, there's, there's some people that haven't read it. It might be useful, but I also don't want to assume. Okay, I'm going to propose I keep going. <laughs> Anybody have a problem with that? Okay, great. Now I have a question. Ah, <laughs> Sorry. <yeah>. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. I've written the framework, and you know, I I read it. I glossed over it the first time, to be honest with you. And the second time, I read it a little bit more slow, slowly. Yeah. Um, you know, like many of us, we just got a million things coming at us. But um, it it made me wonder about the process of how the framework was developed. Like, can you talk a little bit more about like who was involved in the actual uh, work of, of structuring out this framework? I, I'm a little bit curious and, and what did that process, and explain that process, please. That's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so um, I would say like, the majority of the framework's creation took place in uh, in sort of the uh, the space of the equity team, right? And then with input uh, from from ODOT staff, um, but the actual kind of I, I guess you could say, and Hannah, you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the sort of like the heavy lifting, if you will, uh, took place among the the equity team, the equity consultants. Um, that you are the, I think the first people to actually receive a presentation about the framework and get a chance to, to discuss it. Uh, so this is just the beginning as far as I, I, I'm concerned, as far as I could see in terms of that, that public conversation. So I don't know, does that answer your question? A little Anna, bit, feel but free I'm gonna, or, I'm, gonna, send a, uh -huh. I'm gonna push a little bit because sure. that's just my nature. So yeah. my, I'm curious to know when you yeah. said you had some folks from ODOT participate in that in, in structuring the framework, can you provide me with an understanding of the um, of, of the ODOT staff that participated their understanding of equity work? I mean, how well grounded are they or is it just people? I mean, what was the process of who was selected from ODOT to, 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 to work on this framework? I mean, I'm just getting way into the details, but I, I'm yeah. just, I'm just very interested to know if those folks from ODOT have an understanding of DEI, understanding of equity. I think that's important to know, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'll hand it over to, I think, uh, Lucinda and Hannah, if, if either of you want to chime in on that. I'm going to allow Hannah to chime in because I probably wasn't here for that. But what I want to say, Diana, is it's a draft and we brought it here because it, it needs to be yours, your committees. So however you want to tweak it, edit it, whatever it is, it's just a, it's just a draft for you. So go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, like Chris said, you know, this really, we, we're really fortunate. We, um, on the, the project team, we have, um, we have a, a bunch of consultants that are our, you know, our equity um, experts that we, that help us on the project. So like Chris said, um, 
they, they developed this framework. Um, they've been working on it for a while. Um, we should probably get you the names of all the folks that are, that are on our team. Um, I'm, I'm on a first name basis with everyone. So I, I'm just going to wait. Bit. And yeah, so um, I'm just gonna wait and I'll send those to Christine so she, and, she, and we'll have bios so you, you can read that. Um, that would so, be good, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Desiree Williams, uh, Raji, um, uh, Ana Antiveros, uh, Alan Hoffman, uh, who's a colleague that I was uh, referring to that helped write the, um, the Pricing Roads Advancing Equity Report, um, are, are just some of the team members, right? Um, so, but we can get you a more extensive, uh, uh, as, as was just mentioned, uh, sort of names, bios, all that. Right, thank you so much. Absolutely. Any other uh, questions or clarification about sort of the genesis or, or any, anything else that might have been described so far? Anything that wasn't clear? A Abe has his hands up. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious a, a little bit more about the process for step one of identifying who, what, where and if there was conversation in the development of the framework around including why and how. Um, so I think those are important pieces to better understand some of the um, strategies to in, improve equity and, and advance equity within the, the project of by understanding what the impacts look like and why they're occurring and doing some root cause analysis to um, start to develop strategies from, from that frame. So I'm just curious if you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, talk to me a little about about what you mean by why and how. Uh, so just, and I think it's kind of akin to uh, the kind of ongoing conversation that's come up multiple times about, about historic injustices and digging into why those disparate impacts are occurring to um, different communities mm -hmm. and by an understanding in what ways, whether it's through health impacts or economic impacts or accessibility impacts, and then being able to kind of backwalk that to understand where where that's coming from both in current current day and then historically mm -hmm. so that, does that wow. yeah it almost sounds a little bit of uh sort of from like the um could have a, a bit of a public health background also sort of like the health disparities lens mm -hmm. yeah the health and equity um, yeah that's that's interesting yeah um let's just say this we'll um we'll take that as as input um i think it's a, a good point um and uh you know, we, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I don't think that we really went there as much is more sort of um, focused on sort of getting to certain outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. um, like the access, the access to opportunity, affordability, um, uh, you know, having effective community engagement uh, rather than uh starting from that point that you're describing so it's it's um i think it's a really uh really good point of input i don't know if others uh uh have, on the project team have any response to that as well but yeah i, I come from a public health background so that's ah, I think there where, we go where, where it comes All from right, on the same <laughs> same <laughs> same plane yeah right on yeah i think the why can inform you know how how the framework gets used why why the disparity exists diving into the why is really critical mm -hmm. not just the who what and where yeah i think that's really great thinking abe thank you that's great any other thoughts we'll definitely bring that back uh abe for for our team to chew on. So thank you for, for raising that. Okay. So um, if there are no additional thoughts, I'll, I'll keep flowing. Uh, but before I uh, continue on, uh, Christine, how much, uh, how much time do I have left or do we have left for, for this conversation? Because I also want to make sure we, um, we get into some of the key uh, questions. You we need have to... 15 minutes. Good 15? 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll spend about five minutes, kind of covering um, some of the other elements of the of the five steps, uh, some kind of key considerations and examples, and then um, we can spend you know close to ten minutes if that works for everybody on the um, uh, discussion uh, additional discussion. 
Um, so I think we've already had a pretty good conversation around um, process equity. Um, we have a lot of we had a lot of conversation with Hannah about inclusive and accountable participation, um, and some examples that we share in the framework uh, include representation on advisory committees, the number of workshops, their location, number of attendees, and the demographic participation. Uh, but there's also this responsiveness piece, which I think is really important, which includes, Christine, don't get nervous, but quality of meeting facilitation, uh, tolling program communication, um, sort of describing the input received, uh, the ideas and concerns that have been voiced, and how that feedback is being used in the project development, right? So um, I think we, that's another theme that we've hit on today, is being transparent and accountable um, and, 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 and responsive. Um, but it's not, only it's not just important to have uh, an equitable process, but also um, really being focused around having equitable outcomes. And, and um, the three key themes that we uh, kind of hit on in terms of outcomes are, as already noted, affordability. So that can include travel costs and financial barriers, including for the unbanked, people that don't have bank accounts or credit cards, um, access to opportunity, so that can include, um, in terms of uh, example uh, outcomes, uh, change to travel patterns or potential impacts, uh, change to travel patterns, effects on untold alternatives, including roadways and transit um, affected by rerouting or traffic. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things that you can analyze for each of these categories, but um, I'm just giving you a couple of examples for each. And you'll have an opportunity to dive deeper over the course of this process for, for each of these. Uh, community health, so that can include air, water, and uh, noise pollution, safety, community cohesion and, uh, or isolation, and also potential effects on um, small minority owned uh, and disadvantaged businesses. Um, in regards to determining benefits and burdens, which is our, our third step, um, again, I, I wanna emphasize when we talk about impacts, looking at both positive and negative impacts and trying to aim for as much of a positive orientation as possible. So that includes, uh, in terms of an analysis, user costs, uh, including both monetary and non-monetary costs, travel time, including delay or improvements to travel time, travel patterns, including rerouting impacts through neighborhoods. So that was obviously a big uh, concern with uh, kind of initial um, input received from the community business impacts, and then um, finally, environmental impacts, including air quality. So um, in addition to the determining benefits and burdens, um, uh, we need to choose options that advance equity. So um, strategies that advance affordability, that uh, advance public health and safety, um, that can um, create greater, yeah, greater access to, to opportunity for underserved communities. Um, some of these strategies might not be permissible in Oregon uh, due to constitutional restrictions or other, other legal considerations. And so it's important um, for any um, things that cannot be accomplished to find alternatives that can um, potentially add, uh, advance equity in, in sort of similar ways, um, but also to kind of report out to, to, um, to communities about those uh, challenges, restrictions, the extent to which um, the tolling program uh, might not be able to get us there um, as it re relates to um, uh, advancing, advancing equity. Um, and then finally, the, the fifth step is already described is providing accountable feedback and evaluation. Um, so that includes, as I sort of hinted before, incorporating input from underserved communities along the entire planning process and then beyond. Um, so after the construction uh, and implementation of the, the tolls um, and considering community priorities as part of the development of the mobility and uh, the mitigation strategies. Um, it's important to prioritize, so we're calling it as prioritizing funding commitments made as part of the toll project. So, um, you know, once we say we're going to do something, then making sure we're following through and um, delineating what those responsibilities um, or, or delineating, delineating those responsibilities clearly, publicly, and transparently. 
we also uh, uh, in the document want to um, call out making explicit who is responsible for providing continuous oversight of equity issues following implementation of the toll projects. And then finally, identifying any equity issues or concerns uh, raised for which the toll projects are un unable to provide resolution, resolution as kind of noted before. Um, so uh, the last kind of piece that I'll, I'll, I'll hint, hit on is sort of how this will be used. Um, so the whole meeting sequence for the EMAC is uh, based on going through these five steps in order, anticipating about one to three meetings devoted to each step um, of the five steps um, for each of the two project corridors. And um, just to note that we are further along for the I-205 toll project and the I-5, uh, but there is actually still a lot of work to be done on, um, uh, for each of these steps for both projects. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to open up for additional questions, um, any kind of initial responses to the, uh, the framework. You know, how would you like to use this tool? How should ODOT use it? Uh, can you share it with your networks to help obtain additional input? And just overall, just any additional uh, concerns, questions, and, uh, and your thoughts. I think this is really exciting, Chris. I, I've never gone through a process with a framework that is going to guide our, our questions, the information that we need to find and develop in order to answer the questions. So I think it's, I, it, it, it is the first time in a tolling project to use this type of framework. And I'm very excited to be able to take everyone through this. So. I deeply appreciate the work that you have and the rest of the team have put into this. So, yay. Hannah, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor. I just, I wanted to, uh, I feel like I didn't answer your question completely, Diana, um, when you asked who, who at ODOT reviewed it. And so this, this framework is specifically for the I-5 and I-205 toll projects. And so it's, it, it was the project team that, that reviewed it and, and we did get um, some input from Nicotris to use it for, for the project. So we're really looking at it through it's, you know, when we say ODOT, it's, it's for these projects. It's not, um, not, not the agency where, you know, this is like to quote Christine, we are, well, maybe I can't quote you. Sorry, we're charging, charging new ground. Oh, oh gosh, I messed it up. What do you say? That's okay. That's all right. You know what I'm saying. I do. I do. Yeah. No, we're breaking new ground. That's what we're doing. Thank yes. you for that. You're welcome. All right, Michael. Thanks for sharing, Chris. I'm really excited about it and I, you know it's a, it's a really thoughtful plan and I just wanted to share some of the parallels that I'm seeing. Um, I mentioned to this group that I um, at the Bureau of Transportation um, for Portland we're working on a pricing options for equitable mobility. It's a mouthful we call it poem for short but um, in that um, in that um, task force um, we work to de develop an equity framework that leads with race and we did this exercise where we thought about like what is our vision for equitable mobility and I'm seeing a lot of this the same things appear here including like affordability um, access to, to opportunity community health and so just doing that process and now seeing those things also appear here, that is feeling like really solid, um, that what's reflected in this framework is also, you know, what I'm hearing from that task force and um, all of the, the groups um, that that task force is also representing. That's great, that's great to hear. That's awesome. I, I think it's nice to have some um, similarities between two different organizations. I think mm -hmm. that's interesting. I guess re related to that, what, you know, one question I have is when you're looking at affordability and access to opportunity and community health and these buckets and all the potential metrics under all of those, um, I guess, uh, do you, or maybe it's a question to ODOT, like, do you, do you have, um, 
sort of mytho mytho mythologies um, for method, sorry, methodologies and how you're going to collect um, like that specific metric, because um, that's something that we're also trying to think through. And I, I just wonder um, kind of what stage um, uh, are, are we at in this, in this, in that process? Yeah, well, as far. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. So as far as, uh, as, far as I, I understand, uh, we're at the beginning um, in terms of selecting these, uh, these sort of measurements, right? Um, and so I think a lot of, just my, based on my, my involvement with other projects as well, is a lot of it uh, in terms of selection of the metrics or the performance measures is going to be influenced by the availability of data. Uh, the extent to which uh, you can conduct analyses, right, given data availability and also like how recent it is um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Sometimes uh, you might have to go with sort of like a surrogate approach, right? So you know, maybe you can't measure uh, bicycle pedestrian um, uh, fatalities as well, but is there something else that can serve as a surrogate for safety, for example? So um, uh, for bicyclists and pedestrians. So yeah, um, I think we're at the beginning stages and that'll be one of the things that we'll be leaning on you guys again, right, is, is to um, help us identify what are those kind of uh, important metrics and then kind of workshopping it and figuring out, okay, this we can measure, this we can't, but you know, so I don't know if that makes sense. And then uh, listen, you, you were gonna speak to if, if there's anything else you wanna add to that. Yeah, I was, um, thank you for me. that, Brad, at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, but I also wanted to remind everybody that Francisco is your data person um, and can help with that for the committee, right? So as you're workshopping, you have an analyst on your committee now. So I don't see, well, probably because I just don't see him, but Francisco Ibera, who we introduced at the beginning, I think Christine mentioned that he's part of the team now. So he is your um, analyst. And that can help us once you're going to modeling, we have modelers, but you guys can all work that and he can bring that forward. So I think we can help there. Thanks, I'm looking forward to seeing how that all shapes up together. Well, and, and it sounds, Michael, that you guys uh, over at Peabot are gonna be looking at uh, various metrics and whatnot too, right? So maybe there's an opportunity to kind of compare notes. And uh, I'm a fan of, you know, kind of borrowing from one another and, and uh, it might, there might be some value to kind of being on the same page on that. Yeah, for sure. We, you know, we would welcome that because we're um, in a similar place where we sort of have all these, all these different topics that we care about and, and want to find measurements for. Um, and like you said, as best we can with data that's available um, or that we can get. Um, so it, it, that seems like maybe that would be a time to connect some of our modelers together and folks who are really tuned into those metrics, which I admit is not <laughs> exactly my, is not in my wheelhouse, um, but I am looking forward to see like what comes of that. Right. It sounds good. Any other, um, any other thoughts? Uh, I know some folks haven't spoken up yet, so feel free to, to chime in. And Christine, um, how much, how much time do we have? Um, about four or five more minutes. Okay. Uh, this is John. Sorry. I, I don't have my image today. John Gardner from Trimet. And Chris, um, I, what others have said, I think, you know, we, we are in the middle of developing and building out our own, uh, racial equity lens for the organization and so you guys your framework is best practice it's very much government uh aligns for racial equity stuff so it's exciting to see our process is following your processes which is sort of best practice and i think it is it's a big deal to try to put something so specific or the framework on on this project so i'm excited to be a part of it and i'm glad to know that you and your team and, and the rest of the experts are all sort of staffing it so thank you in advance Thank you, John. That's good. That's good input. I will say that one, one thing, um, I'll just talk from personal experience here. And I think it's, it's good for you guys to know in a way is that um, sometimes you have like an equity expert, like I'll be brought in uh, to be kind of like the equity guy for a project. In this case, you guys have a full team basically at your disposal, right? Um, sort of like an all-star team of, of equity um, advisors coming from multiple lenses. 
So um, from that standpoint, I think I'm, um, I mean, I'm very proud to be on this team. I think it's, uh, it's kind of a novel uh, kind of approach of bringing so many different um, kind of perspectives to the table. And, um, and yeah, just so you know, kind of who's, who's behind the, um, who's behind the shop, right? We'll, we'll be um, sharing that out as Hannah mentioned um, in terms of who, who kind of helped bring this together. And we'll be working with you guys being a resource for, for y'all. Um, Eduardo, Fabian, Bill, anybody else? Um, speak now or forever, hold your peace. No, just kidding. There'll, there'll be more, more opportunities moving forward. <laughs> I, I can um, share really quickly my thoughts. I think my, my main concern and um, what I want to learn more about is um, affordability and how we're going to be able to ma maximize um, economic benefits, especially in this time where there are many um, folks in the immigrant communities who aren't receiving any stimulus checks from the government. Um, so that's like a main concern for me. Oops, I was on mute. Yeah, I know that's uh, really important. Thanks for, for sharing that, Fabian. Um, clearly, in the context of, of what's going on right now, affordability looms large, right? Um, there's, a, there's an analysis. I think it would be, be uh, good for us to come back to you guys with uh, the analysis that was conducted in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver, BC, uh, uh, with the pricing study that, they, um, that they're considering over there. And they did a, an affordability analysis and they looked at income, I think it was like quartiles or quintiles um, to find out uh, what, the, what the sort of implications would be uh, in terms of um, price tag, right? Affordability for um, each of those populations. And then they, um, they basically in doing so were able to identify, okay, uh, higher income people are gonna pay more overall, but then as percentage of income, lower income people, I think we're going to pay more. And so what would it take to equalize that? They gave that a dollar figure estimate. And then um, my understanding is, and the idea is, well, what they're looking at is then um, kind of compensating back in some way, uh, whether it be like a check at the end of the year or, or, or some other approach um, to at just bare minimum have a level playing field on the affordability front, right? That's just to kind of get, make sure everybody's like equal in terms of proportionality of cost on the cost side. Um, and then that doesn't, that doesn't kind of consider the other angles that we can come about it too, right? So if you provide folks with free transit passes, if you provide folks with, uh, I'm just kind of talking examples here, but better transit service, maybe by providing great transit, somebody can shed a car, right? Instead of having three cars in a household, you can have two, or even one, and then that you know provides significant cost savings as well. So, um, so anyway, there's there's um, analyses that can be conducted, and there's things that can be done uh, as part of a project like this. And uh, I think it'd be great to, like I said, circle back with you on uh, a couple of examples out there where agencies have tackled the affordability question. Thank you, Chris. Thank mm -hmm. you, Fabian. Park and then our Eduardo and then we're going to move on to public comment. Uh, the value pricing uh, policy advisory committee uh, recommended that there needed to be alternatives um, and mentioned expansion of transit but also mentioned carpools and van pools and I, I wonder if there's been any work on what that might uh, do in, in as, as a benefit here that should be put into the hopper? Well, I would, I would say that um, that is uh, definitely a set of tools and toolbox that, that can be leveraged because not everybody's gonna be able to use uh, transit or is gonna be able to like live in a corridor where transit is gonna be viable. So what kind of other transportation uh, options can be provided in those areas, uh, such as you know, low density uh, suburban context. So absolutely, and there's places like San Diego, for example, with their express lane program, where they have gone full throttle in, in um, investing and in subsidizing carpool and vanpool prog uh, programs. In San Mateo County, close to where I live, I live in San Jose, um, uh, they have a, a program that uh, incentivizes carpool, uh, uh, carpooling as well through um, forgetting the app, but sort of an employee uh, employer carpool carpool app 
Um, and so they're using it as a way to kind of spur uh, more carpooling there as well. So absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Was there, was there one more person? Who wants the last word? Come on, Eduardo, I, I know you got Eduardo. something to say. I know, I put Eduardo on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's well, anybody else? I would just echo the, the sentiment on uh, the metrics uh, part of it, especially when it comes to community engagement. When, um, at what percentage, what's the threshold for saying, okay, we were successful in reaching the Latino community, the African-American community. Uh, is it just, you know, so setting those uh, thresholds and then also, um, Hannah, I'm looking forward to looking at the website for, for the open house. Uh, several, there are way too many times where I see that the contact person for the project is not a multilingual uh, person, a, a, a bilingual person. Um, and I think that's an issue when somebody uh, is trying to get a hold and they are, um, and they have to wait for somebody uh, to call them back or it, you know, it takes time um, to find the answer that they need. So just considering that when we're putting together the open house. Great. Well, I just want to say thank you all for, for the input that you provided today. Um, this is not your last crack at it. If um, you didn't get a chance to read it in advance, or even if you did, um, you know, pre please let us know, follow up with, I guess it would be Christine. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. With any input that you have, whether it be sort of like the clarity, right? Um, if there's something that we may have missed, um, let us know. And uh, we, we will be um, definitely taking your, your input into account. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. We're going to move into the public comment part of our um, program this evening. I see that we have two people with their hands raised over in the attendees part, uh, three people now. So I'm going to ask when we start our, uh, I'm going to do the screen share right now. Um, for the public comment. So Susan, if you can pull up the two minute timer, that would be fabulous. Um, if you are on a phone and you want to raise your hand, please do star nine, and then you'll be able to be called upon. Um, and I guess the, you are sharing the countdown right now. And so I'm gonna ask John Lewis, um, Susan, do you advance him? Uh, yes, I can okay. unmute him. So, so John, yep. So John Lewis, you have been, I believe you are unmuted now. So you may begin in two minutes, right, Christine? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, my name is John Lewis. I'm the Public Works Director for Oregon City, and I was just really enjoying the conversation. My question isn't too long here. It's uh, quite, my question's about how much does the tolling options really matter to this committee's work? And I'm asking that because I'm not sure. After listening to it, I've been very intrigued. I uh, really appreciated what Cooper Brown brought, so I commend ODOT to uh, this work. And Chris, your, your discussion was, was excellent, so I, I really enjoyed hearing that. But from my perspective, what I heard from Lucinda is what we've heard in the past, which is narrowing the options. And if the options don't matter to this group, if, the, if this is about kind of looking at, um, uh, you know, the topic that you're, that you're kind of faced with, without regard to options, I guess um, that, that makes, that, that's okay. And I just wanna make sure if options really matter, then what I heard from Cooper was a pretty open, you know, open-ended box for you to work in. What I heard from Lucinda was five options, and we're, we're struggling with that here in Oregon City, and I just want to make sure that um, this group, I mean, the value pricing feasibility analysis, I don't feel was as informed as this group is planning to inform, and so we hope that uh, if, if the alternatives really matter to the, this committee's work that you consider 
alternatives beyond what, what's maybe showing up in the study. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate that. Ian, I'm going to allow you to talk. Go ahead. One second. Unmute. I'm going to unmute. So are you unmuting, Christine, or do you want me to unmute? You can or unmute. Can you me? There, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was hoping to, uh, you know, it's, I think this might be the wrong meeting, but I believe that in order to make equity systemic, that it needs to be part of individual performance evaluations up and down the chain of command not only for ODOT, but for the uh, contractors and for the consultants and everybody else that does the work. And I'm hoping that, you're, that ODOT, after decades of harm to uh, people up and down the corridor for the I-5 and the 205, that uh, they will consider starting to make equity objectives as part of performance evaluations. So like I said, you can finally make it systemic. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Really appreciate that. Um, Susan, can you unmute Christian, please? I can. I'd say with great confidence. There we go. Christian is <laughs> unmuted. Hi, I think I'm unmuted. I was hoping for a video. I put a nice shirt on and everything. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Christian Trabel. I'm with the Overlook Neighborhood Association. For those of you unfamiliar with Overlook, we're the neighborhood that has Swan Island. It's kind of the last one going south before you get to the 405 split and then into downtown. Uh, we've been working with the OTC for, it seems like years now, on the issue of where the I-5 tolling will begin. And I bring this up to you guys because you guys are doing great work on uh, equity issues and I really appreciate everything you, you're doing and the conversation tonight I thought was fantastic. But there's a subtle shift in the documents that you shared. Um, I would point to the purpose of the committee in the draft charter, which is what came down from OTC, that one of the items listed is a better understanding of neighborhood benefits and impacts for the communities near the toll facilities, e.g., changes to cut through traffic, pedestrian, bicycle options, transit access. Uh, when it comes to the draft committee work plan, however, uh, this changes a little bit. And uh, one of the benefits you're studying is strategies for managing and limiting potential vehicle rerouting from the freeway through neighborhoods with significant populations of historically underrepresented and underserved communities. Uh, this also manifests in step three, determined benefits and burdens including uh, traffic patterns, including potential rerouting impacts through neighborhoods with significant populations from historically underrepresented and underserved communities. Um, the point I'm making here is that one of the tasks assigned to this committee uh, that we were assured by OTC was that you would look at all neighborhood cut through impacts, uh, specifically with relation to the start of tolling on I-5. Right now that's slated for the going Alberta Street exit, which goes to Swan Island. That's in Overlook. We're hoping it'll move north to the interstate bridge to prevent all of the cut through North, through north Portland. Uh, I just am asking that you keep those items in mind as you move forward with your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that is everyone that has their hand up. Uh, Christine? Yes, wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then that will take us to me sharing the screen. Can you stop sharing, Susan? I am just, just <laughs> could not make that fast enough. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. I had one job. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh no, this is all hard. Are you kidding? <laughs> all right. Next steps. Um, we will adopt the um, charter at our next meeting. We will uh, come back to a revised equity framework and adopt that because we got such great feedback this evening. 
We'll begin to understand the environmental review process and have a discussion around that. Um, and um, we'll also take a look at the work plan because uh, I gave you the work plan for the rest of the year earlier um, this week and we will examine that document and make sure that we're all on board and our next meeting is August 26th at 3 30 in the afternoon so um, I'm excited for your work I think this every single person here is passionate about what we what we're talking about I think we're beginning to gel around what our, our, um, our mission is, and I am extremely excited. Any um, wrap-up comments by anyone? I open the floor. All right, I'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great evening.